Okay, so we're going to stay in Sperm of the Genesis for the next talk still. And uh, it's going to be Kirsten Finker who's going to tell us about um, T snares and how they promote cytokinesis. Cool. Hi, um, thanks for the introduction. As he said, I'm Kristen, and I'm a graduate student in Jillian Stanfield's lab out at the University of Utah. So in the Stanfield lab, um, we are studying the process of sperm development as a model for cell division. And it's a really interesting model for us because it's regulated in many different ways. And so um, even though there are many really interesting questions that I could ask about the molecular um, mechanisms that guide this process, one thing that I've been particularly interested in is trafficking. And so as some of you may know, our lab has historically been very interested in this last step of the process, the transition from immodal spermatids to modal spermatozoa. Um, however, as I was investigating some trafficking proteins in this context, um, science being science, I actually discovered one that functions much earlier in the process. And because there's not a lot known about how membrane trafficking is coordinated during meiotic divisions, I decided to use this gene, um, 6-7, as a tool to understand this process a little bit better. So 6-7, or syntaxin 7, is part of a conserved family of um, genes that assist in membrane fusion events um, during trafficking. And uh, work from other labs had already shown that syntaxins um, that are expressed in sperm promote fertility. And additionally, in other organisms, um, syntaxins have been studied um, quite a lot for their function in the acrosome reaction, a specialized exocytosis event. Um, and they also um, have been shown to function in meiotic cytokinesis as well. And so based on this previous work, um, it wasn't too surprising that I was able to identify a specific syntaxin that uh, functions in sperm development. Um, but what we are really excited about with this project is it now gives us a starting point to look at conserved um, components of vesicle trafficking machinery um, that function in a really um, specialized type of asymmetric cell division. And now we can start to ask questions about whether these proteins play a broad general role in cell division or if they might be fulfilling um, these specific components of vesicle trafficking or um, fulfilling some unique requirement um, for meiotic divisions. So when I first started, um, became interested in looking at 6-7, I used CRISPR um, to make alleles. And I did this just by targeting guides early and late in the gene. Um, I was able to recover a number of um, large deletions that we think are probably nulls. And so the first thing I noticed, even as I was recovering these um, CRISPR alleles, is that the fertility in these animals is quite reduced. So this is just showing hermaphrodite fertility on the left by the average number of self-progeny. And looking at 6-7 compared to wild type, it was quite reduced. And the males show the same pattern. To look at male fertility, I crossed males to fog two mutant hermaphrodites that don't make any sperm and counted the cross progeny. And just like hermaphrodites, um, the fertility was greatly reduced. And then finally, to confirm um, that this reduction in fertility was truly due to loss of 6-7, I expressed 6-7 transgenes and showed that this rescues the fertility defects, although I don't have that data in my talk today. Okay, so uh, we are a sperm lab. I was hoping um, that it was a sperm defect, but as we all know, there are many different things that can contribute to um, reduced fertility. And so one of the first things I wanted to do with this project was rule out contributions from other common uh, things that would cause uh, fertility reduction, such as embryonic lethality or um, defective oocytes. So first, I tested if um, six, loss of 6-7 causes either developmental or embryonic lethality. And to do this, I counted the number of eggs that hermaphrodites laid, and then a few days later, counted the amount of um, offspring that had made it to at least the L4 stage. That's just shown here as the percent viable offspring, and there was no difference in the 6-7 mutants compared to wild type. Next, I wanted to test if 6-7 um, mutant animals had healthy female germlines. So do they make healthy oocytes? To do this experiment, I... Um, crossed males that were wild type, other than a um, GFP marker to allow me to distinguish cross progeny, to hermaphrodites, and asked if just providing normal sperm um, in this way could rescue the fertility defects. And as this graph shows, um, it did. And so this was a really exciting experiment for us because it says that as long as the animals have normal sperm, um, they're capable of having normal levels of um, fertility. And it really it was a sperm defect that we were looking at. So what do these sperm um, actually look like? 
So these images are um, showing the seminal vesicle from male animals, and there's dissected sperm to the right. So if you look at the seminal vesicle of a wild-type male, it's full of these small, round um, spermatids. You can see the nuclei in the center of these cells here. However, if you compare this to um, 6-7 mutant animals, um, you can see the seminal vesicle in the 6-7 mutants, it's full of these large, um, abnormal-looking sperm cells. I next wanted to confirm that um, these defects we were seeing were due to a cell autonomous effect. And so to do this, I used the sperm-specific promoter, um, PL1, to express 6-7 specifically in sperm cells and ask if this rescued the fertility defects. And we found that it did. And if anyone's really awake and looking at my um, y-axis here, these look a little low, but that's just because I did this experiment in a HIM-5 background because I also wanted to visualize the sperm um, in the rescue line and confirm that they looked normal as well, and they did. Okay, so the six, seven mutants are producing these large, abnormal-looking cells. And the next thing I wanted to do was further characterize the defects um, that these cells had. To do this, I used um, markers for cellular structures to look at what was going on inside the cells, including DAPI for the DNA, as well as MitoTracker to visualize the mitochondria. So in wild-type spermatids, um, they each have a single um, haploid nucleus, as well as some mitochondria. And when you look at the 6-7 mutants, there's no obvious defects um, with the revealed by the MitoTracker of the mitochondria. However, in the 6-7 mutant cells, um, there are multiple nuclei, and this is uh, most often four nuclei, contained within a common cytoplasm. And so our conclusion from this experiment is that these 6-7 mutants, um, they appear to proceed okay through the nuclear divisions of meiosis II, but then cytokinesis is either not happening or it's failing for some reason. So to get a better idea of when and um, how um, things are going wrong in these six, seven mutants. I've been performing time-lapse imaging to um, look at meiosis in the cells. And Amy did a great job of introducing um, sperm development, so I won't take you too much through this again. But when I start this uh, wild-type movie, um, you'll see the cells start off as a primary spermatocyte. Um, the chromosomes will get pulled apart, um, and then um, the spindle will reorient. They'll get pulled apart again into the haploid um, nuclei that segregate into the spermatids, and then at the end of the movie, a spermatid will butt off. Okay, so it should, there we go. So um, they're getting pulled apart, the spindle reorients. You'll see the spermatids um, start to bud here. The residual body um, forms in the middle with the spermatids surrounding it, and this one on the top right um, will butt off by the end of the movie. Okay. So um, that was a wild type movie. Um, and I'm going to show one more movie of wild type to re that really zooms in on this um, budding stage. And what I hope that um, you notice here is that as um, the spermatids progress into budding, um, the meiotic spindle, it actually retracts into this central residual body. And not only that, but there's an enrichment of the GFP tubulin right at the junction of where the spermatid is um, budding from the residual body. So that's what um, wild type looks like. And um, as you might be able to tell just from the single image um, that I'm showing here of the six, seven mutant cells is that they look quite different. So um, they're quite disorganized compared to wild type. And in wild type cells, they always form this very symmetrical pattern budding from the residual body. Um, they're about equally spaced around the residual body and they're usually comparable size as well. However, these six, seven cells, um, they vary quite a lot in size. Um, they're not equally spaced around the residual body. And when I start the movie here, here we go, what you'll see is that they're actually in this very dynamic state of budding, where they'll try and bud, um, get reabsorbed or partially reabsorbed. Um, they do that for um, a small amount of time, and then eventually everything just collapses back into this single multinucleated cell that I've been showing um, throughout the talk today. And the other thing to notice here is that there's no, um, although the um, my meiotic spindle does retract back into the residual body as we see in wild type, um, there's no concentration of the GFP tubulin at the junction. And this could indicate um, spindle defects or it may just be a side effect of the fact that abscission isn't occurring uh, properly in these cells. And I plan to look into that a little bit further. Okay. 
So I've shown you that 6.7 functions to promote cytokinesis, and we have a couple of different models that we're considering for how this might be occurring. Um, these first two ideas have to do with the fact that maybe 6.7 is responsible for delivering necessary components to the division plane. So this could be something like membrane components or machinery that's needed to actually ingress the furrow or to complete abscission. Alternatively, 6-7 um, might be functioning upstream, and the cytokinesis defect that we're um, seeing might be um, a consequence of something that's going wrong earlier in the process. So unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about all of these models and how we're testing them um, today, but I am going to end with a little bit of um, preliminary data that supports that maybe one of these first two um, ideas could be happening. And so either of these first two ideas could be consistent, would be consistent with an endo or exocytosis um, defect of the cells. And when I dissect wild-type spermatocytes into media containing the vital dye, FM143, which marks the plasma membrane, we see si uh, signal from the plasma membrane um, throughout uh, the time that the cell is development. But there's also an internal signal. Um, and so this indicates that spermatocytes are undergoing active internalization of the plasma membrane. And you may notice the signal gets brighter and brighter here as the cells develop. However, if I dissect 6-7 um, mutant spermatocytes into the same media, I see quite a different pattern. So you'll notice here that most of the staining from the dye um, is localizing to the plasma membrane, and there's much less um, signal um, in the internal part of the cells. And so uh, we think that maybe these 6-7 um, mutants have um, defects in internalizing the plasma membrane, and this is something um, that I'm also going to look at further as I continue with the project. And so um, this is just a model based on the data that I just showed you. And I mentioned that one of our main ideas is that maybe 6-7 is required to um, get necessary components to the division plane. And one way that it could be doing that is through being involved in um, endocytosis of something from the plasma membrane and then getting it um, to where it's needed during division. Um, I'm still testing aspects of this model as well as some of our other models as well. Um, but in conclusion, um, I've told you today that membrane remodeling during meiotic division relies on conserved trafficking machinery, including the T-snare 6-7, which promotes cytokinesis after the nuclear divisions of meiosis II. Additionally, because 6-7 appears to be required by sperm, but it seems that it's dispensable elsewhere in the worm, uh, one idea that I'm really intrigued by is the fact that um, spermatocyte cytokinesis might have a unique requirement for vesicle trafficking. And there's some really interesting data from Drosophila that this happens with Drosophila spermatocytes as well. Um, however, based on the work that I've done so far and what I shared today, um, another simple explanation um, for this could just be that um, due to redundancy of syntaxins and other cell types in C. elegans. But I am very intrigued by this idea, and it's something that I want to keep thinking about um, as I continue this project. And so that, uh, with that, I just have um, my acknowledgments. Um, I'd really like to um, thank my lab. It's fun to hang out with people that are as excited about sperm um, as I am. <laughs> uh, Jillian is a fantastic mentor, and I'm really glad that she let me um, pursue this project, even though it's really different from what our lab has worked on in the past. Um, Daniela is my uh, fellow graduate student. Abby is a great undergrad who helped me recover some of the CRISPR alleles. Uh, Cyrus is a summer student in the lab who, um, as we speak, is back in Utah working on a suppressor screen for 6.7 that I'm quite excited about. Um, Julie is our tech. Uh, the GFP tubulin marked strain that I used um, for the movies was a gift from Mara at Brooklyn College. And also thank you um, to the CGC and my funding, um, as well as the organizers. It's been um, quite an honor to be able to um, have the opportunity to present my work among all the great research that I've seen these last few days. So, with that, I'll take any questions. The pictures you showed were all of the of spermatocytes that were making four spermatids. Yes. But some divisions, some of them are going to divide in, into two cells after anaphase one. Yes. Did you see? that that could happen normally in some cases? Did you ever get uh, terminal things that were half size? Right, with, you mean specifically with the 6-7? Right, so is, yeah. is, is, this, is this gene required for that first division? Yeah, so that's actually a really interesting question. And I've done a number of these movies. 
And um, another thing that I didn't have time to talk about today is that first division that you talked about, where they can either completely divide into separate secondary spermatocytes or they can remain attached. And with the 6-7 cells, I've always seen them remain attached. And the other interesting thing is I've spent a lot of time looking at the, um, the kinetics of this process. And during that division, the 6-7 um, spermatocytes, they take much longer and they don't go through it nearly um, as smoothly as wild type 2. So I, th I think that's an interesting aspect too that I want to look at further. My next question is, did you look at the FBMOs? Not yet, so I'm actually um, working on some EM as we speak that will hopefully um, get at that question, yeah. Hey, so it looked like these are, the null mutants were fertile, a little fertile, so do you think those are, are, they, are some of those spermatids escaping and, and able to, to sort of become uh, sort of mature spermatozoa, or are these weird sperm able to fertilize eggs? Yes, that was a very good catch. So when I look at the animals, the vast majority of sperm are those large abnormal cells, but they are a little bit fertile, and they do make some cells, a small number that look like normal spermatids. Um, I've done some measurements, and they're smaller than wild-type spermatids, but I need to further characterize the few spermatids that my mutants do make and see um, how they might be different or similar to more wild-type sperm. Thank you.